Wendy Kelly. It's uh, July 31st, 2013, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and with me is Nancy Bartlett, uh, but I want her to say her full name and spell it. My full name is Nancy Reynolds Bartlett, N-A-N-C-Y, R-E-Y-N-O-L-D-S, Bartlett is B-A-R-T-L-I-T. Excellent. And I use the name Reynolds because that's my middle, you know, my middle name now, because my father was in the Manhattan Project at Oak Ridge. My father, Thomas George Reynolds, was born in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and he, but he was raised in Lombard, Illinois, and then went to the University of Illinois, where he was a, um, a chemical engineer. He was a a civil and a chemical engineer, and I can't remember which which degree came first without checking the records. But um, I was the fourth child, and was living in Cranford, New Jersey, at the time of Pearl Harbor. I had turned five that fall, and Dad was getting a master's degree in Columbia University with Harold Urey, and he was doing isotope isotope research on nickel and he didn't know he died before he knew that his research had been declassified I learned about this after he was gone but uh, anyway he was working with Harold Urey uh, who was a Pulitzer Prize not Pulitzer uh, Nobel Prize winner later and uh, he was at the uh, uh, office of the war during World War II. He was the personal representative of Harold Urey during heavy metal research up in uh, Trail British Columbia and then he also was sent to Oak Ridge. He graduated with his master's degree and then uh, was working for Kellogg's, Kellogg Corporation in New York City and then Kellogg Corporation formed Kellogg's Corporation which is the company that helped to design the K-25 plant. And Dad worked on that. And we lived in New Jersey, and he would go down to Oak Ridge. My mother said that she had a suitcase at the front door with fresh clothes, underwear and shirts and whatever, waiting for Dad to grab it and to go and disappear. She didn't know where he was going or what he was doing during the war. And she said she remembered he always had blueprints in his hand. So he worked on that plant down there. But um, it, it, he, there was a, a dinner for the Kellex Corporation workers, uh, engineers, and uh, I guess physicists, whatever, uh, that was held in October of 45. And these men received keys uh, f um, for their efforts during the atomic. Uh, research and um, he has a certificate of appreciation for having worked on the Manhattan Project and so I have some of those details that I can send you for your archives to follow up with my story and of course I, I just ordered again those first volumes of the New York City uh, maps that show Columbia University and show Kellogg's Corporation and other things which I wish I could talk to my father about now. He told me all about this before I really became a historian of World War II, before he died, and we didn't record it. And I wish I didn't have my tape recorder with me at the time. So a lot of that material is gone. However, I have a, I have a booklet of his career in a box and that I can go through again and see what I can find. But I also have a letter that, you know, he had to sign that he could not um, give away secrets or he would be in violation of the federal law, as all the people who worked on that sort did. And um, so that's kind of, you know, his work there was, what he did was secret. Uh, my brother said that um, um, there were a lot of engineers under dad but I don't know if that's hearsay or what. Um, 
there was one story about him going down to Oak Ridge and uh, with all the security, he went to the men's room and the, uh, uh, the skylight was open. And so he thought that was a breach of security and he told the story and of course the security people came and closed the window or closed the skylight, things like that. But I don't know other stories. Um, when my husband John Bartlett, whom I married and brought me to Los Alamos after I taught in Japan, uh, uh, worked under a man called Ed Hamill. And uh, he just passed away this year in his 90s. And we had Ed over for dinner one time. And I was telling Ed about my father, and Ed said, oh, I must have had work with your father because I was getting my PhD at Princeton under the same project that, that uh, you were doing under Harold Urey at Columbia. And then, at the, then Ed and his wife Carolyn were in Trail British Columbia for maybe eight or nine months before he came to Los Alamos. So, so um, and Ed's the one that told me my dad's research was um, declassified after my father left, you know, was gone. There's a wonderful story. This is a side, but it's a human interest story. Um, I'm one of six children, and I was the fourth. And um, my next youngest sister, Cynthia, was born in um, 43 during the war. And my folks wanted to have another child so she would have a companion since the uh, rest of her family were so much older than she. And um, so the story is that when they finished the K-25 plant, Dad came back from Oak Ridge and called Mother and said, put on your, put on your prettiest clothes and come up to New York and we'll have a celebration for my part of the Oak Ridge ending. So mother did, and uh, nine months later, I had a sister, uh, Susan. And she was named Susan Victoria uh, Reynolds after the end of World War II. The atomic bombs stopped the war in August, uh, you know, August 14th or 15th, whichever. And then the um, surrender was September 2nd, and Susie came October 30th. So she was named Susan Victoria because of the end of World War II. And we moved to Kansas City. I was in fourth grade and I had a new school. A new, I lost my, we lost our dog. Um, I had a new sister. It was a very um, interesting time for me, a challenging time. So that's that part of the story. I am a historian and I, I'm also a detective, and I think historians are detectives, because we're, we're looking for that, the serendipitous ways of finding information you never expected. It's around the corner. And as Winston Churchill says, we're, we, we're trying to recreate the passion of former days. And for me to have gone to Japan and taught for two years in Sendai, and while I was waiting for John to finish his PhD at Yale, he's a chemical engineer too. I swore I would never marry an engineer because we moved so many times. But to then come back, marry John Bartlett, who had worked at Los Alamos while I was in Japan as a summer student. Uh, and then for us to come to New Mexico was, you know, something unplanned, but it was meant to be. And we found out that um, John, because of the way we spell Bartlett, is related to the family that started the Boys Ranch School. And that's the reason why, you know, the Manhattan Project came to Los Alamos, the whole history of that. Peggy Pond Church is the third cousin of John's father, Fred Bartlett Church. I mean, Fred, Fred Bartlett. And uh, we found that out pretty early on. I had given um, my family and his family 
her Peggy Pond's book at the house at Odewee Bridge for Christmas. And John's mother came to visit and she said, you know, I think we're related because there was a Bartlett that married a Pond and they moved to Detroit. And, uh, and then she didn't know what happened. Well, meanwhile, John and I started getting active in air pollution control because the New Mexico was being polluted by the Four Corners power plant. And also there was a paper pulp mill that was going to be located in Albuquerque, Rio Grande Valley. And it, the hydrogen uh, sulfide fumes were, would, go, would float up to Los Alamos hundreds of miles, well, a hundred miles away. So John got involved and he gave a talk in Santa Fe and Peggy came up to him and said, do you really spell your name B-A-R-T-L-I-T? -I -T? He said, yes, and she said, we're related. And so that started a beautiful friendship. Uh, Firmer, her husband, became our treasurer and one of the founders of our environmental group that helped to clean up the air in New Mexico. and. Uh, Peggy is just a lovely person. I got to know her real well. and So that's part of that history. And as you know, or maybe people on listening don't know, I was head of the Los Alamos County Council, like the mayor, eventually. And uh, so I have my, my, I say, one foot in Los Alamos, the Manhattan history, and the other foot in Japan and the J Japanese connections. and. As a historian of World War II, that gives me a unique perspective um, because I understand the Japanese approach to the decision making as well as the Western, and I try to teach that. Um, one cannot understand the atomic bomb story and interpret it without understanding how the Japanese make decisions and how they think and how the emperor did not have the power to stop the war. It's like Amer Westerners think, well, since President Truman had the power, he's our president, he's the chief military officer, he can make that decision. You cannot equate them, they did not have the same kind of power. So what I teach is how the Jap it took a week for the Japanese to make a decision to accept this, uh, the Potsdam Declaration but it, but the men that were that made the decision ultimately committed ritual suicide uh, right after the decision was made, and there were many Japanese officers who committed ritual suicide afterwards, and that part of the story is in the books, but it's not well known by people who are examining whether the bombs should have been used or not used, and this is a unique viewpoint I have, I don't tell people what to think. I just report the facts and let them kind of figure it out themselves. But I think that if Westerners impose their way of thinking about decision making on the Japanese, they're not coming up with a correct solution or reason for why things happen. Would you like to um share with us what you've concluded about all this? Yes, I'm an author of a book called Silent Voices of World War II, when Sons of the Land of Enchantment, of course New Mexico, met the Sons of the Land of the Rising Sun. And of course that's Japan, with that name was given to them by the Chinese, because Japan is east of China. So I just thought it was kind of, you know, a pun on sun, sun, sun. And uh, uh, we tell four stories in that book. We talk about the men from New Mexico who were in the New Mexico National Guard, who were the first National Guard to be federalized and sent to the Philippines in the fall of 41, where they expected the Japanese to attack in the spring. So MacArthur was preparing troops from the Philippine uh, youth and using American troops and our about 200 men uh, from New Mexico and some from Texas were sent there and caught. And then the other story we tell is about the Navajo Code Talkers 
who uh, were from both New Mexico and Arizona, but initially Arizona was part of the New Mexico Territory, so we claimed them. But we tell about they were Marines in the Pacific and they helped to shorten the war by a year. And then the third group of people that I specialize in is the, are the people, the men who were ja of Japanese descent, who were either immigrants or citizens who were sent to the internment camps in New Mexico. And why they were brought as quote unquote dangerous enemy aliens away from the coast as potential spies and brought to the gateway to the biggest secret of all of World War II is kind of a puzzle uh, to the CCC camp. And then the Manhattan Project, which is the development of the atomic bombs, how it's shortened the war. And then I talk about, it took me three years um, reviewing, reading, interviewing, because you must realize that I came from Japan and visiting Hiroshima and Nagasaki before I came to Los Alamos and knew the, the development of the bomb history here. And it took me a long time to understand the history, but in interviewing the, the men who were POWs for three and a half years and who were abused by the Japanese guards in camp and having them so grateful to President Truman for using the bombs and shortening their time uh, as prisoners of war, I became to understand that in the big picture, those bombs rescued those men, the half of the men who were sent over from New Mexico. It saved at least half of their lives. It saved the lives of other prisoners of war from Australia and the civilians, because an order had gone out by the Japanese to all the commanders of the camps. The once we attacked Kyushu, or the Japanese, one of the Japanese four main islands, all of the prisoners were to be exterminated without a trace. So in that case, those men's lives were saved. They were also dying off from starvation and cruelty and disease without being uh, uh, serviced by medical help. And so their, their lives were saved. Um, the Navajo Code Talkers, we only lost about, um, I think it was 11 out of 450. They were our radio men. They were protected because they were the communicators from the beaches to the sh to the um, um, front line front line to the beaches to the ships, and they knew how to get out of the way uh, after they delivered their message because otherwise they would get shot at. Um, they're a wonderful group of people, and their commander said they shortened the war by a year Be because they used their language which came from New Mexico, and New Mexico was remote and isolated. And even though they were punished for using Navajo in the schools, um, they were so brilliant. All of this translation went on in their heads. They weren't allowed to have notes. So that was amazing and marvelous. And then there's Los Alamos and the whole story about why Los Alamos was selected. There again, I go back to serendipity. Um, uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer was a sickly boy and his folks had money in New York City. Back in those days, cities were terribly polluted. And um, so his parents sent him and his brother out to New Mexico where many lungers came to clear up their illness. So it was a pattern from east to go out west. Even the boys' ranch school was based on that pattern of having uh, uh, young men come out and get healed by the clean air. And because of that, he, on his horseback, discovered the boys' ranch school, which had been in place since 1918. 
And uh, so when, when uh, they were looking for an isolated place that had buildings, etc., to be used for the research, so the scientists working on this top secret could find a place to work, uh, Los Alamos was selected. And that is serendipity to me. <laughs> And then my husband bringing me there instead of going to work for a, a gasoline company, you know, in one of the major big cities and making lots of money uh, instead of working at Los Alamos um, was also a choice. And uh, so I felt, I feel as though it was meant to be. And I think that um, the National Historic Park eventually will bring Los Alamos and these other cities together in some way with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, I would like to see, I would like to see students of the Manhattan Project go to all those places, either physically or virtually. There are so many things that are in the Hiroshima and Nagasaki Museum that talks about Japanese aggression um, I visited 14 uh, museum, uh, war museums and peace museums, and I missed three that I didn't know about, um, to learn what the story was being told in Japan. And when I was taught there back 58 to 60, the Japanese would say to me, we started the war, you ended it, and that was it. And in my studies and going to Asian conferences and all, I found out that the Japanese really didn't blame the United States for using the bombs to stop the war. They were starving too. Um, but it was when we had our tests in the Pacific and the fishermen were, were um, radiated that they started this campaign. Now, there are other incidents other historians that have been, whose opinions have been accepted in Japan that makes Japan feel as though they were victims of the atomic bomb, you know, was testing other sorts of things. But by and large, my generation, people that lived through that, understood that the bombs uh, were needed to stop the war. Also, I have a, a a study that was done by a, a PhD graduate who explains um, and does a study of the popular culture. The Japanese knew all about atomic power. They were doing research on it. They had atomic scientists who went to school with the European scientists at the time. They were doing research. Their cyclotron was thrown into the bay by our conquering army people. It's very, very interesting. Uh, and it talks about why, why General Anami did not use the word the atomic bomb was used in Hiroshima. It was a very special bomb, not atomic bomb. But they sent their atomic scientists to investigate, to see. So um, then I tell more stories about what happened to uh, um, again, why it took so long. The second bomb was indeed needed to convince more people in the war cabinet that we had more than one bomb, and that was the threat of the third bomb, which generally convinced an army. That's my belief, that's my research, and I communicate with Professor Sadao Asada, uh, who was went to Carleton and then to Yale and as a professor of history at, in, uh, well, I think he's retired now, Doshisha University. And that's his opinion too in doing his research, that the bombs were unnecessary to shock Japan into the surrender. I taught uh, at a girls' academy in Sendai. Well, that was my main job. I taught um, junior high, senior high in college level English as a second language and typewriting because this was a private school founded by Protestant missionaries but all mixed up at this point. After the war the Japanese mixed up the 
various private schools that allowed the Westerners to come in. But after hours, I could do whatever I wanted. So I taught at UNESCO every Wednesday night. And that class was basically young boys from the university, engineering students who were planning to come to America or work with American firms. And one of the young men is an, is an engineer. And he became very, uh, very, we became very close. We're the same age. And, uh, uh, he came over and made his fortune here in the United States representing Japanese firm. Um, he, uh, I won't go into that, but he's retired now. When I wrote the book with Professor Rogers on Silent Voices of World War II, he said to me, let me, let me see a copy. If I approve of it, I will promote it in my, my circle of business people from Japan and my friends from Japan. He read it, he sent me a five-page review of the book and supported everything in the book. And at the very end, he said, thank you, America, for rescuing us from our military. And I learned later that this young man, when uh, he, let's see, he was, we were nine with the end, that year, we turned nine, the year the war ended. His home had been burned by napalm from other B-29 planes. And his family survived because they ran into the forest, whereas the other people who went to the underground were suffocated by the smoke inhalation. And he has no, uh, no, reg you know, no um, uh, criticism of the United States for doing what it did because we rescued Japan and the Japanese citizens from their military. And if you think of the Japanese military as you do, or I do, of separating the German culture from the Nazis, then you can kind of understand the parallel with the Japanese having to acquiesce to, you know, samurai type mentality. And they were controlled by this and uh, the whole imperial system. Uh, took over. Um, anyone, if you go to the museum in Kyoto, you learn about in the 30s, you, if you were in favor of peace, you were either killed or you got out of Japan. And I've met people who's, uh, have here in the States who said their fathers and mothers got out of Japan because they were not warlike and they escaped. So, uh, and the Japanese museum tells about that. And so, uh, in a sense, we rescued them. But, but uh, Onozuka-san, he's my friend. I go visit him and his wife. He's taken me to uh, San Jose, which is like Japantown. And I'm so excited. A few weeks ago, I was in Seattle at a, at a conference of the Japanese American National Museum. And the guest speaker was uh, was Norman Mineta, former Secretary of in, of Commerce under Clinton, Secretary of of Transportation under Bush, and he when he he was the former mayor of San Jose. He's in my book, and then he was in Congress, and he's the one that after three tries finally got the law passed that apologized to the Japanese Americans for what happened during World War II and gave each of the survivors $20,000 for their effort. But at least it was an apology and we were honoring that. I got to meet him and have dinner in his company with some other friends who were survivors of other camps. And so I'm sending him my book because uh, there's a story in it about a baseball bat that was taken away from him as a young boy who just got it for Christmas when he was sent to the internment camp because the baseball bat was considered a weapon. See, it was a shock to me. When I learned this, it was in Honolulu at an Asian conference. And there was a professor, uh, a professor from Pittsburgh who's a Japanese American whose father was in the foreign, foreign service 
and she's lived in England and she's lived in Germany. And she specializes in the difference between the Germans accepting their fate after World War II and telling the story. And the Japanese who are not on the national level, they do not tell about the aggression. They, they do not tell the truth. And if they, and they try to change the truth. And the J Japanese are not taught the truth. And the, there are stories or not stories, but there, are, there was a lawsuit by one of the professors who's passed on trying to get the textbooks to include about the Japanese aggression. And the reason this is important is because it has affected the international relations with Asian countries. And, uh, oh, there's so much I can tell you. <laughs> um, the Prime Minister, when the Prime Minister goes on the day of surrender, uh, the, day, the day when the Emperor, the anniversary of the day when the Emperor's voice was broadcast on NHK, all of Asia shudders because it's symbolic of the Japanese aggression, the uh, Japanese attitude, uh, and it's, it's a, I think it's affected the relations in Asia. And it, the, the, the story of the Manhattan Project is so important because, and what happened in World War II, because even years later, decades later, it's affecting international relations. Um, Carolyn Kennedy is going to Japan to be our ambassador. Oh boy, would I love to have lunch with her and talk to her about things. Um, I, I just like to know her understanding, but uh, the Chinese teach their children about the Japanese aggression, the rape of Nanking. The Chinese children grow up knowing the story. The Japanese children do not. I, I'm, I, I'm generalizing, but the story needs to be told. And there are people in Hiroshima the peace people who try to tell the story, and they have interviewed grandfathers who fought in the war and they did atrocious things, who will tell their children about the atrocities they did. But if you study the military training, if you study the, the um, kamikaze training and the cruelty to their own military young men, you can understand the cruelty to our POWs. And that you have to learn about surrender. When I teach, when I give my lectures, you know, I talk about surrender and that no one could surrender but the emperor. And that it was, oh, this is so complicated, but it's the opposite of what we think of. We try to preserve a life, we try to save life, we in the West will give our life for our buddy. We will give our life for our country. What is different from the kamikaze will give his life for the emperor? There are differences, but I, ra I raise that for the student to examine and look at the different values. But in Japan, the, and during World War II, the Japanese soldiers who were sent to the islands were not expected to come back. The kamikaze, trained kamikaze pilot was not expected to come back. And if he did come back, he's ostracized. They, the the um, officers who surrendered their troops, and there were very few, were treated worse as prisoners of war when the prison, our American prisoners were sent to labor camps in Japan. It was against the law to surrender. So one has to understand that whole concept of surrender uh, uh, to understand, again, what surrender meant to the men who were still trying to keep the war going, or to the emperor. And when the emperor finally said, you know, after the first atomic bomb, according to Professor Asada, the emperor was ready to stop. He saw, he was, he was ready to stop. But General Anami and the other men who had the deciding vote were not. 
And even after the second weapon was dropped, he was not convinced. And then I tell the story about the third weapon, and of course, uh, we had um, a lecture in Los Alamos by Don Farrell, who came from Tinian, and he gave us the details about the stopping of the third bomb, which was on it, the, the material for the third bomb was stopped in California, it was on its way. And um, so that's a fascinating story about all of that and what they believe. And uh, so I don't know how I got off on this tangent. Let's see. Um, okay, you want me to go back to the um, internment? One of my dear friends is Bill Nishimura. Bill is still alive. He turned 93 in June. He was a young boy in his early 20s. Uh, worked with his father on a vegetable farm in California, near Torrance, California, when the, when the war broke out. And he spent his war years in four camps. And Bill was uh, initially, Bill moved from the far coast of California, Oregon, Washington, in, in ter inside the state, because it was cut in half. And these people didn't think they would have to go to internment if they could move more inland. But then the order went out that all of the j people of Japanese descent, if they weren't already further inland, were going to be interned. And so Bill was sent down to Poston, Arizona, where he served. Because he knew Japanese, he was not trained in Japan. He was American-born. He knew some Japanese. His father uh, was in the Santa Fe internment camp, and the American guard, the American commanders of the camp, Poston, along the Gila River area, uh, said to him, "What would you like to join the MIS?" And Bill said. I will join the MIS when you release my family from internment. I am an American citizen. I am a born citizen of the United States. And when you release my family, I will consider going in the MIS. So they brought their, his father from Santa Fe to Poston. And a couple weeks later, they called him into the headquarter office and said, are you happy now that your father is visiting? He said, yes, but we're still interned. And you have not given my family its freedom that it deserves. And so they sent Bill and his father up to Tule Lake, which was called a segregation center, for all the people who would not fight for the United States or wanted to go back to Japan for different reasons. And so Towards the end of the war, toward the very, very end of 44 and early 45, there were a number of men that were brought down from Tule Lake. The men who had been in the Santa Fe camp were much older, average age 52. But Bill came with his father together. His mother and his sister are still in Poston, Arizona. And Bill was in this camp for the rest of the war. His father got cancer of the stomach, and so he had he, he missed the opportunity to be sent back to Japan because he was nursing his father. And then it was not till April of 46 that he and his father were sent down to Crystal City in Texas. And then they were let go. For this, he received $20,000 by the United States government when there was the Civil Liberties Act passed and signed by President Reagan. And it was a symbol that no uh, Japanese man of Japanese descent or woman were ever convicted of any kind of crime or spying. And the United States government knew that they would not be because we had broken the code magic. And we knew that the Japanese were not going to use Japanese um, uh, immigrants or 
citizens for spies. They used Anglos. They used um, the Anglos is a Spanish word for New Mexico. They used Gaijin. They used whites or German spies for spying, basically. So anyway, it's 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 a different story of the war. But the interesting part is that why did they bring them to the CCC camp in Santa Fe? There were CCC camps all around New Mexico. They had 500 beds. They expanded it to 2,000 beds. It was in the city limits. It wasn't very far from where Dorothy McKibben had her office at 109 East Palace Avenue. But the men were in the camp. And until the message came from the Philippines about how the men were mistreated, uh, the Japanese internees could go out and work in the orchards and work in the vegetable fields in Santa Fe. And then when the city found out that their boys were being mistreated, they stormed the camp with pickaxes and all kinds of sticks and whatever, and they were stopped by the commander. Uh, and then the internment became a protection of the lives of the men in the camp. But they were brought there because of what they did, their profession, not because of any act that they did personally. So that's another wonderful story, interesting story. Uh, they were brought there because of their profession, not because of where they... That's right, because of their profession. Did you explain that? <laughs> there was an ABC list, an ABC list. The A's were... Uh, people who had uh, influence in the community, Buddhist priests uh, and uh, it's, it, newspaper people, editors, uh, principals of schools. Um, and they were, by virtue, by virtue of being from the country uh, of, of, to whom we went to war, uh, they were enemy aliens just by virtue of that. Um, so was Enrico Fermi, an enemy alien. But he wasn't a dangerous enemy alien because he was a scientist and they needed him at Los Alamos. His wife was a Jew and that's why he was protecting her life to come over here. But he was, he was treated differently. But the Japanese who were by virtue of being born in Japan and came over here to make their fortune were considered dangerous enemy aliens by, by their profession. And so they were rounded up, there were about 2,000 rounded up in the afternoon of Pearl Harbor and brought to different prisons and camps and then ended up in Santa Fe. Now those people that came to the Santa Fe camp, which was run by the Department of Justice, were lucky because their rights were protected by the Geneva Convention and they had the opportunity to complain and, and uh, make their lives more comfortable through the Spanish consul. So when they were in the camp, Santa Fe camp, they had lots of things to do and amenities, etc. But they were watched and their mail was censored and uh, their cameras were taken away, things like that, but they had much to do many sports, uh, and they could visit people at, you know, a house who came to visit. If they were sick, they could go visit families uh, if someone were sick. But um, as Bill Nishimura says, we had no women. There were no women. But then I, sh I talk about neither did the Marines on the ships. There were no women on the ships. There were no women on the beaches. Uh, the men who were in the uh, 200th Coast Artillery or New Mexico National Guardsmen didn't have women. They didn't get mail once they were prisoners of war. They were separated. Um, the men in the Manhattan Project, the FBI followed Oppie around, uh, J. J. Robert Oppenheimer. We call him Oppie in Los Alamos. I suppose it's, it's, a, it's a loving, it's a loving, uh, name for him. It's not disparaging in any way. And um, 
because he is beloved in Los, his legacy is beloved in Los Alamos. And uh, anyway, uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer was followed by the FBI wherever he went. His telephone calls were listened into. Uh, the mail was, was uh, also censored in Los Alamos. The, uh, the scientists were allowed to bring in their wives but not the men who were the SEDs, the engineering division, the military men. Their wives couldn't come within 100 miles. So they were separated during the duration. And so if you, and they were in barracks. Barracks were universal. The barracks, I'm not making light of what happened to the Japanese because they were put in horse, you know, uh, uh, centers for horses, stalls. They were put in horse stalls in, uh, in California until they were sent off to other camps. Um, they were treated terribly. Uh, the cultural differences, the misunderstanding of the American Americans about the Japanese culture influenced what happened to them. It, the ignorance of how the Japanese, especially of that generation, behave, and their system of honor and integrity, and the firstborn. I mean, Bill was the firstborn oldest son. He had a responsibility to the family in a way that the firstborn American boys do not have. And so you have to understand that. So that's part of what I teach in... Uh, I think it's part of the story of World War II, but the irony is that they were brought here to Santa Fe, just a few miles away from 109's palace where all the people came who were going to Los Alamos. And General Groves knew about it. So you said that there were 500 beds, they expanded to 2,000, there were that many people there? Uh, there were 4,555 all told, from the time the camp opened, then it was closed temporarily, and then it was reopened, and then closed in April, May of um, 46. Uh, and uh, yes, no, no more than 2,100 people in the camp at one time. So what, from your, your research, um, what became of these prisoners? What kind of, did they, decide to return to Japan? Did they give up on this country? Did they forgive this country? What kind of? Both, all of the above. They, um, I, I just gave a, le a lecture down at Fort Stanton, which was the place where the uh, German seamen who uh, gave up the ship prior to our going to war with Hitler um, were, were um, sent and they built their own camp outside the fort, which was a fort that was built to attack the Apaches years ago. General Pershing was there. I think MacArthur's father was there for a time, but there was this huge camp out across the river from the fort. And um, they, uh, after Hitler attack, you know, uh, 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 declared war on the United States. These men also became enemy aliens, but they were not military. They were seamen from a cruise ship, and uh, the Nazis, uh, who were part of that camp, who were quote unquote troublemakers, were taken outside that camp and set aside. Well. The counterpart, the Japanese troublemakers, the, you know, I told you about the men came from Thule Lake who were sent, were sent to Fort Stanton and then on to Japan. There were 17 of them and I, six of them were American born. And most of them were Japanese language teachers. And if you, if you inter, when you interview the men who were in the camp, uh, yeah, and today, those those boys, the people that are telling the stories, if you go on a pilgrimage and you inter listen to their stories, they were like eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve years old. 
they had a lot of freedom because they could play with their friends and they could eat in the dining hall without their father giving orders. It broke up the Japanese culture that way. Um, but when they talk about their experience with the Japanese language teachers, it was not pleasant because they're, they're very, very exacting. Japanese language teachers are very exacting and human nature doesn't come into the, you know, what goes on, you have to. It's like the trains in Japan, they're always on time. Anyway, it's, it's, it's interesting to listen to them. Um, but anyway, all these things that happened to these people and when the bill was signed, the most important thing to the Japanese survivors was the apology, that they had not done any wrong. Um, but $20,000 didn't even cover what they lost in terms of careers. Their property was often uh, lost, stolen, not protected. There are wonderful stories about Caucasians who took care of property, uh, made sure that it, uh, their investments were taken care of. Those were the lucky ones. So 20000 and it was only given to the people who were still alive who had been in the camp, not their heirs. So that's, that's another part of the story. Um, but their lives were, their lives in camp were cut short because of the bomb. They went, they, and you asked about where they went. Well, they had to, in some cases, they were dispersed throughout the United States. Instead of being uh, a ghetto or something like that, still in the West Coast, uh, the colleges, like Carleton College, my, where my da our daughter went, uh, was one of the early colleges to accept students. Um, and the Quakers did a lot to get the young people. And these people were, some of them were already in the military and they were, their guns were taken away from them and they were made cooks and chief bottle watchers and for a while. Um, there were some from Hawaii. I go to Honolulu to get pick stories and photographs uh, because there were a number of Hawaiians that came, were sent to Santa Fe because, and there were school teachers, ed educated people. Fishermen, fishermen, because they had shortwave radio, radios on their boats. Their boats were confiscated. Uh, you know, the Japanese sent submarines. There were submarines along the coast. There was a submarine that attacked an oil refinery along the coast. These incidents are not told. I, you know, I, I was in New, New Jersey and uh, my mother said I used to hide under the bed because I would hear the sirens, I would see the searchlights, and we would have to pull the curtains, the black shades, and go to bed early, turn the lights out. And um, so I don't remember hiding under the bed, but uh, I, I remember there were, there were submarines sighted. And of course, you know, the submarines, how many tons uh, vessels were sunk by the Japan German submarines for the first part of the war and, or before we got into the war and we finally figured out how to how to fight back through the submarines um, so so the threat the threat to was a real one I mean it in the Pearl Harbor plan you know was was not Yamamoto's plan it was one that was taught uh, it was taught West Point, and it, it was planned, you know, but they never thought it would ever happen. Um, these are the fun things about being a historian.